looking at you, kid. That's the rumor. Nobody puts baby in a corner. Get away from her, you bitch! I'll have what she's having. You move, Chief. I've been poor my whole life. Not true. I'm going to kill you in one minute, man. It is extremely rude. Funny how. You can't handle the truth! Not, not quite my tempo. Mm -hmm. Is this your homework, Larry? Well, this is it up yours. Where I'm from. No fighting. And here we go. And a one, and a two, and a skiddly diddly do. Hi everybody! Welcome to this <laughs> is reviewable. <laughs> this is episode eight, I think, right after Christmas Palooza, and we have a special guest. Say hi, everybody! It's me. Hi, everybody! It's me. You all know me. It's Sarah. It's Sarah. You all know my me. sister, Sarah. Our regular guest. <laughs> I'm a regular guest on many yeah. podcasts. Yeah. This is definitely not my first one. That's right. <laughs> definitely doesn't make me nervous she's here especially to talk about movies that we just don't watch very much that's right i i feel that that a genre of movies a genre of movies represented it has to be yes has to be acknowledged um mainly because it's my favorite genre and for those of you listening that have been listening that have been following you might have a guess at what that genre is I'll give you two seconds to guess. Historical films. Correct. Rom coms. That was not two oh, seconds. <laughs> no, what is it? Twenty points go to Micah. Horror movies are my favorite. I love horror movies. And we are afraid of them for the most part. <laughs> and that's okay. They're not for everybody. And I genuinely acknowledge that. I just got really excited. I I listened to your first episode. And I did not know what to expect, but I really genuinely enjoyed it. And then oh. I was listening to them regularly as they were coming out until I was no longer driving to work. So it's fair. then I stopped and then now I'm behind. But I do really genuinely think it's a good podcast. And Hooray. I, I like listening Sarah. to it. It makes me laugh. Oh. It entertains me when I'm driving in traffic once a week. So okay. I got excited and I was like, I want to share my... My favorite horror films. And Hell characters. yeah. Well, we're Thank excited. you for being a regular listener besides my mom. <laughs> the listeners can't see, but I'm I just... going to have to bleach that name out. So I guess we can, <laughs> Do you really? I guess we can say the for episode. For anonymity. Yeah. We protect everybody. Yeah. Did I already say a bunch of stuff that has to be edited? I no, no, no. I said something that has to be edited. A couple weeks ago, we said my brother's name and we bleeped it out. <laughs> you yeah. had to go through and listen to the whole thing and find it. <laughs> yeah. Which is um, fine. And now the viewers will know that someone named our <laughs> also listens. And they can figure you out. You just who said that it is. again now. <laughs> well, I know I'm going to have to go back and edit it anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, but the idea of editing something that's like an hour or over an hour long is very cumbersome. So props to you guys for doing that. It's, I mean, at it least editing the audio, think. it goes pretty fast. Yeah. 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 yeah it's okay. not as bad as you might think. Yeah. I think like cutting audio together is a lot easier than like cutting video and making sure that like sound effects mm -hmm. add mm -hmm. add in yes. just on like the videos that i've edited just editing the audio is a lot easier yeah because you can see like it would be super weird watching if you guys were to have like recording and on youtube of like us talking you'd have to there would be like jumps in it and it would be really weird yeah right yeah mm -hmm. makes sense yeah okay okay so the movie we watched this week is called Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Came out in 2017. Should I read my prepared statement? Please. Okay, here it is. Mildred seeks justice for her murdered daughter by renting out three billboards, calling out the local police. Comedy, tragedy, and drama ensue from the director of In Bruges, Seven Psychopaths, and The Banshees of Inishirin. If you've seen any of these, you know what you're in for. That's it. That's all I wrote. It's good. Okay. Michael, what did you like about it? Um, I thought that it was... Good. It was a good movie. Moving on. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no, I thought that it was an interesting concept of 
you know, you feel like she's not hurting anybody by putting this up, these billboards up. Yeah. It's just an interesting way of getting things done that I never would have thought about. Yeah. Uh, maybe I didn't do a good job. Basically, her daughter dies and has been dead for, I think it's like six months or something. And she puts up these billboards in the small town that are calling out the chief in particular of police because no arrests have been made. So she's trying to get it moving along, basically, bringing it back into the public eye. So that's what you're referring to, right? Yeah. You never considered doing that for no. your murdered daughter? Exactly. Yeah. You know, because there's always like the stereotypical, your kid dies and the chief of police doesn't do anything. So then you are threatening and you go on the news and you're writing letters and petitions and all that. Which like, some of that stuff mm -hmm. is the correct way maybe to get this stuff done. But like, who would ever think about calling out the chief of police via a billboard yeah. on a road that nobody drives down <laughs> apparently the director got the idea because he was traveling in the south and he saw oh was this in your it oh. is but keep going okay anyway he got the idea because it's something that he saw when he was in the south yeah he actually so saw that yeah like some something like okay. this like a billboard let me read that's you. pretty clever but i have to admit it would suck if you're day job as the chief of police. So I don't have stats Statistics. and I didn't look this up ahead of, uh, ahead of time, but, um, All stats I are made up anyways. Heard... Just say whatever you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I heard that, um, okay. I don't have the exact numbers. So, um, these are hypothetical. It could be wrong. I heard that like the overall solving of murder rate of the country went from like 50%. Okay. Making up these numbers disclaimer but it went from like 50 percent to like 30 percent from 23 to 22 2023 to 2022 um so like wait 2022 murders. it was 50 percent and then 2023 mm -hmm. it's now it 30. dropped yeah oh something oh, okay. like that i don't know the exact numbers but, but like, like a big amount why well i think because they're probably understaffed and i don't know oh, yeah. i'm not gonna try to get political at all but like i, I, I know when i heard that i was like like, what are they understaffed? And the person I was talking to was like, yep, exactly. Well, Who knows? Oh, no, no. I heard that, like, a lot of people were quitting the field. That's what it was. Uh, because of all, of, you know, all that stuff. everything. Yeah. You wouldn't, like, want to be... I would imagine it's probably a lot of younger people in the uh -huh. that are police officers that are probably like, oh, you know, like, this isn't, like, popular with my friends. That would suck. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? You come home and you're, like, doing your best and then you see that billboard on the side of the road. Okay. Yeah, I haven't seen this movie, so I don't. That's okay. Which that's exactly what happens. The chief well, is Woody Harrelson. Yeah, mm. and he's generally very much a liked guy mm. in the town, and he doesn't feel like the billboards are fair. It's not fair, fair mm. to him personally. Yeah, but it works because he he starts working on the case again. It brings attention to the case again. Um, yeah. And sometimes it needs to happen. Yeah. This, so this this also is a dark comedy, which sounds mm. um, maybe surprising given the subject matter. But the guy, the director, that's his thing. He does dark comedies. And this one I'd say is maybe like 60% dark, 40% comedy. Does that sound right? Or is it more yeah. comedy? No. Okay. Uh, it's not more than that. All right. Yeah. Okay. This is 60% dark cacao. For all you dark chocolate enthusiasts. <laughs> but it's it's also very funny. That's one thing I love about this guy's movies is he nails the balance. He does such a good... Yeah. There's this one part. What's the main actress's... What's the main character's name? Uh, Mildred. Mildred. So her ex-husband was abusive and he shows up to their house one day because he's upset about these billboards. Basically, they get into this argument and he pushes her against the wall and is holding her by her throat and her son is standing behind him with a knife, like, don't touch my mom, basically. And oh, the ex-husband's girlfriend walks into the house as the scene is happening. Mildred is pushed against the wall by her throat. Dad's standing there holding her. And then the kid has a knife to the dad's throat and the girlfriend walks in. She's like, 
uh, I just wanted to use the bathroom, but it <laughs> seems that something's happening and you guys are busy, so I'll just wait. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Could you imagine yeah, walking yeah. into that? <laughs> that's um, crazy. I'm just going to leave. That's uh, that's Samara Weaving's character, the girlfriend. Oh. In this movie. I told her oh, about okay. this a okay. little bit. Yeah. Um, so, like, not wait. a funny thing to walk in on, What's, what's but the... a funny reaction. What's the name of the director? uh martin martin mcdonough mcdonough yeah he's a he's english but his parents are irish so a lot of his movies are very connected to ireland mm. this one though obviously is in america yeah but he's so. bringing that british humor british dark humor we like the dry british humor yeah we do we do okay. um that's cool another thing i liked there's a scene with a deer in this movie and i'm not going to spoil any more than that but that scene in particular, I really loved, and that's all I'll say about that. But you remember that scene, right, Micah? Yeah. All I can picture when you talk about Deer as a horror movie fan is one getting hit by a car, oh. and then the character having to put it out of its misery, because that happens a lot in horror movies, especially in the beginning. It's like a trope, almost. Because then, the, then they get trapped in the woods or whatever? No, it's usually just like symbolism or like for character development for later um, on or like, killing an like how thing. or how they react to killing the deer yeah or uh -huh. something it's usually symbolic okay i've seen it i cannot tell you how many times i've seen that in a horror movie when the beginning of the movie or close to the beginning somebody hits an animal with their car and then it comes back later as like symbolic yeah this that doesn't happen in this mm, it, okay. it's a very like touching scene mm. that deals with like does you know the existence of god and or like reincarnation it, yeah it's really really good this <laughs> this part so what don't you like <laughs> what, what don't you negative. want so what don't you want <laughs> let's get <laughs> um, nasty okay so it, do, it is a little bit long it is very slow yeah mm -hmm. but but it's like how long is it i think, I think it's, it's like two and a half hours maybe. oh that's long it really? is pretty long but that's it's like long. but it's also funny mm -hmm. and it has something important to say i think I'm actually going to get to this in a little bit because there was some controversy about this movie when it came out. Um, movie that's 40% comedy. That's two and a half hours. Oh, it's actually seems like an weird. hour and 55 minutes. Oh, oh never well, mind. still a long comedy movie is, is a pretty rare find. I think. Yeah. So that does cool. it well. Yeah. Right. You know, cause that actually always, makes you laugh. Yeah. Cause you know, like there's like the step brothers humor, which is, yeah, okay. you don't want to sit there for two, two and a half hours yeah. just listening to Step Brothers. And there's plenty of dark comedies and there's plenty of horror comedies, but one that you walk away from fe not feeling like you just watched something like sorrowful. Yeah, and that's long. That's pretty rare, I think. This is sorrowful. Mm. Th this is like a big theme is how people deal with grief and guilt, and the, I think the mm. biggest theme is misplaced anger. And how um, letting that control you can just cause more harm in the future. Mm. That That's a huge theme in this movie. The theme, in my opinion. And we'll talk about that in a second. But what did you not like about it? I had one and then I forgot it, so you go first. Well, that was it. It was just a, oh, little, that was it? It was just a little long, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was slow moving. So I just felt kind of unresolved at the end of this. And I think they did a really good job of the way that you feel unresolved mm. but i still don't love that feeling yeah I, but also yeah. you know life's not perfect and you know this is supposed to be like a yeah. snippet into their lives mm -hmm. and so it's okay to feel unresolved because that's real life yeah okay but i don't love it that's valid this is making me think of like catcher in the rye and why a lot of people hate that book is because and i didn't see this movie so i don't know if it's like if this is on point or not but kind of like a movie that's a or a piece of art that's about a snippet of life that doesn't really have like a resolution or like mm -hmm. yep. a very fine point on it that's exactly what this is like yeah okay mm -hmm. so you think like you dislike it for the same reasons maybe that people dislike that book probably somewhat i haven't read that book oh. I, I need to okay so that's right. good that actually probably saves us a lot of time <laughs> <laughs> this, is probably gonna, <laughs> this is probably gonna be long your longest oh, episode, okay. 
I'm the first guest. That's I right. Know. It's such an honor. It is. Oh, sorry for clapping. <laughs> no, That's fine. fine. Um, okay, should I get to the controversy about this movie? Yeah, so I do have a title for... Well, actually, this is, this is a separate thing. I created a um, title for the controversy section. Okay. So your, your section, your famous segment can be a different title. Okay. And that's fine. Okay. Um, so this is called Controversy? <laughs> that was it? Yeah, that's it. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, so there's a character in this movie, and spoilers ahead. So should we give our rating right now? Uh, let's give our I rating. remembered what I didn't like. What was it? And this is stupid, and I don't think it's fair against the movie. I love Sam Rockwell. And I love the characters that he plays. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't love his character in this. You didn't like who his character was. Yes. Yeah, okay. But he played it well. He played it very well. Yeah. So it's not a knock against the movie. It's a knock against Sam (laughs) Rockwell. Not really. Against against who his character is. Yeah. Okay, let's just, let's give it a rating so that we can get to spoilers and then people can just skip to the next one. Okay. So I'm going to give it nine swears at the Thanksgiving table out of ten. Dixon, you goddamn asshole. I'm in the middle of my goddamn Easter dinner. Sorry, kids. <laughs> okay. I'm going to give it an eight Molotov cocktails. Out of ten. Out of ten. Okay. All right. Now to our famous segment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Controversy? <laughs> Okay, so spoilers ahead, by the way, again, this is your last warning. So Sam Rockwell's character, whose name is Dixon in the movie, is one of the cops that works for Woody Harrelson, and he is a racist. A little racist. Yeah. And he gets something of a redemption arc in this movie, and people had a major problem with that when this came out, because he is using slurs throughout the movie, and it's there's like a reference to him having tortured a black man while the black man was in custody at oh, some point. Um, they never really like resolve that at all, like because he denies it and a couple of other people deny it, but like it keeps popping up. Like mm. that's what people have heard about him, so they keep throwing it at him when they meet him. Mm. And then he, you know, he's using slurs and stuff throughout yeah. the movie, but he gets he starts to kind of turn his path around towards the end of the movie because of this case. And people had a huge problem with that because they saw it yeah. and they saw they were like this movie doesn't deal with the race issue the way I wanted it to. Mm-hmm. But I think what they're missing is this movie is not about the race issue. It's just about misplaced anger. And this character is full of it. He's full of misplaced anger. He attacks that that dude that um, owns the billboard shop or whatever. Red. Right. After the chief of police dies, the chief of police has cancer in this movie, and he dies. And then he gets so upset that he walks into the billboard office and beats up Red and throws him out the window. A second story window. Yeah. Wow. And and Red's a white dude. And like he, he walks out of the building and he says, See, Red, I have problems with white people too. So like... I think that this movie is about showing like people with anger and how they don't deal with it properly. And it's not necessary. It's the, the problem it's trying to tackle is not race. But they do bring up the problem of race by having a character that's racist. Like, yes, you might have a problem with white people, but it's not because they're white. It's because of something that they did or you can perceived that they did. Whereas racism is inherently based on physical characteristics in it entirely. I mean, it's unfair of him to attack a billboard store owner for sure. Mm -hmm. But like they did kind of set themselves up for that a little bit. Like if you're going to make a racist character, you better be prepared to deal with the weight of what that means. Yeah. But But I didn't see the movie. That's fair. This dude sounds like he's out of control. But he's, yeah. So, (laughs) and also like it is set in the South and his mom is like, a classic southern prejudiced woman so you you can sort of see where maybe some of his issues come from Mm -hmm. um but i don't think that the value of the movie is discounted for me 
because mm-hmm. they didn't focus more on the race stuff. People well, and I think it's okay for a movie not to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's a, you know, I think that this controversial thing is okay because it has people talk about the movie and it yeah. talks about yeah. how should they have done it. Mm. You know, it doesn't have to make the movie bad. It could just be like, I, I wish it was this way instead. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's okay. And also, I actually was thinking about this. People were complaining that he was redeemed by the end of the movie. I'm not really sure that he is. I don't think he is. And I don't think that Mildred is either, because she's another character that she's so angry about what happened to her daughter that she puts these billboards up, right? And throughout the movie, it almost like kind of... Like, I feel like when you're watching this movie, you're taking sides. You're either on Mildred's side, or you're on the Felice's side, or you're on whoever's side, or whatever side, whatever. And I was on Mildred's side, but then Mildred tries to burn down the police station because someone burned down her billboards and she assumed it was Dixon. Mm. So she lights a bunch of cocktails on fire, throws them into the police station, and Dixon is in the police station when she does this. That's the chief of police? No, the the racist cop. Oh. And she almost kills him. So she didn't know he was in there. She didn't know, but like she made a decision. Uh, you know, a knee-jerk decision based on emotion that was wrong. So she has a lot of anger that she doesn't know what to do with or how to deal with either. And so by the end of the movie, you're not really on her side anymore. And so you're you're kind of just watching these characters wrestle with their anger. Yeah. And by the end of the movie, what Mike is talking about, like the cliffhanger, we are not sure if they're getting over it. No, they're not handling this in a very... yeah mature stable way yeah it kind of seems like mildred especially she kind of has like a downward arc of yeah. like mm-hmm. being okay obviously she's not okay Ish. her daughter <laughs> died yeah, yeah. Right? in a very brutal way yeah but like civilized she yeah. starts out civilized yeah. yes i would say she does and then at the end of the movie she's definitely not because mm-hmm. of how the movie ends yeah Sounds like Catcher in the Rye, just watching characters Interesting. just struggle with yeah. their feelings, yeah. basically. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I actually think it's really ballsy. The movie? The yeah. whole movie. Hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Like, you wouldn't, you don't see very many movies that try to, like, take a character like Dixon and, like, make you see him in two different lights. Usually, if there's a character like Dixon, they're showing you... They they make him, like, cartoonishly just evil. Mm-hmm. Like, this movie was compared with Black Klansmen because they came out at the same time. If you think about the KKK people from that movie, cartoonishly just horrible people. Then you have Dixon, and you can argue whether or not they handled him right, but it's it's much more new. It's a much more nuanced, nuanced look at someone that has, like, despicable traits about them. And that's hard to yeah. deal with as a viewer or a yeah. reader or a listener to deal with something, a character or a person that you usually kind of see black and white and being forced to look at the shades of gray. That yeah. is really hard Yeah, as a, a consumer of any yeah. type of art. And it is ballsy because, yeah, people aren't always going to like that. And I haven't seen the movie, so I can't say whether or not I think it was good. But Wait, did you watch this movie? No. Wait, have you seen the movie? I thought you said um, you saw this movie. No. <laughs> you said you didn't watch it? I didn't. I did not see the movie. This movie, I did not see. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think okay. so. So you did see it. I think, I, I think I'm it. caught up, but I just have one clarifying question. Right, okay. Did you see this movie? So I saw it, but I didn't hear it. So you were just watching the audio or the video? You would you say you watched it? You've seen it, but have you watched it? You know, I did you understand? Stood there and it played, but I was in another state of consciousness, as well as another state. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Because we were in Utah when we watched it. But I was there. But you were there with us. See it. Okay. And I haven't seen it. Okay. All right. Did you finish your famous segment? Yeah, that's it. Okay. That was very So, moving on to our next famous segment, I have two options for what we can call this, and you may choose. Sometimes crime is not prime and not so sublime. Okay. That's option number one. Okay. Next option is <laughs> signs about crimes that in time contain grime. The first one was better. I like the first one. Okay. Yeah. So this the is our second one I didn't understand at all. <laughs> <laughs> I just looked up rhyming words. Yeah. Okay. Good job for 
Cheers. Okay, so now it's time for our famous segment. Sometimes crime is not prime and not so sublime. Okay, so this is where we... Sublime. Sublime. <laughs> um, Did you talk about that movie in any of your episodes? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, we didn't. No, we haven't. No, yeah. Before. That was right before we started. That'll be a secret surprise maybe for the listeners. Okay, so the part that Brayden was talking about earlier about the deer that Mildred encounters. Um, so apparently that deer is a local celebrity. Really? From the WNC Nature Center. Wow. So, you know, that's fun. I couldn't, WNC I couldn't Center? tell if that guy I have was, no idea. Oh, okay. I couldn't tell if he was real or not. Or he like looks a, totally fake. Yeah. So Someone I don't know if like they real. green screened him in. Or, or, like, or she, I guess. She's or yeah, a my bad. Yeah. Her, the deer's name is Becca. I think she Aww. deserves to be recognized. Becca. Aww, go Becca. So the director, how do you say his name? Martin McDonough. McDonough wrote the part of Mildred for Frances McDormand. And at first she didn't want to play it. Okay. And he said that sometimes when you write a character, you're thinking of a, a specific actor or actress that could play this. And like sometimes you just shape it around that, but it doesn't have to be that. Actor. Yeah. And he was like, if we didn't have Francis McDormand, I don't know what we would have done. Hmm. Yeah. And I can't imagine anyone else. Seriously. Yeah. She does such a good job. Everyone in this movie does a really freaking good job. And the reason she didn't want to do it, she said, is due to the character's age. She doesn't believe that a 38-year-old... Okay, this is what it says. McDormand loved the script but resisted for over a year, specifically because she didn't find it realistic that a woman in Mildred's socioeconomic class would wait until she was 38 to have her first child. Really? Which I think is fair. Oh. Hmm. You know, growing up in lower middle class yeah. in a very small town, I believe that. Yeah. Okay. Maybe she didn't know. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to argue with Francis McDormand. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> My next fact is um, Mildred only cries once in this whole movie. I'm trying to think of when mm. that is. Now. When she wakes up in the morning and she's talking to her slippers, she basically says, oh. Suck it up, princess, yeah. to herself. <laughs> but basically, the director felt like in a lot of movies, it's like a therapy session and there's mm. too many people crying. Mm. He's like, That's not necessarily how everybody processes their feelings. Some people internalize their things, and that's what happens with Mildred. She's internalizing all her feelings and then acts out mm -hmm. like the police station yeah. or the end of the movie. Or the dentist. Even just the billboards themselves is a pretty big yes. thing to do. Yeah. It's definitely out there. It's oh, definitely yeah. out. Out of pocket. Yeah. So she made an action, and it's out. So you could say that it's acting out. Yeah. And then my last little fun fact, Braden already kind of mentioned this, that the director was had seen this in real life, uh -huh. billboards. McDonough. Uh -huh. That's how you say it? It's pretty close. It's like McDonald's, McDonald's, but you just McDonough. don't do the olds at the end. McDonough? McDonough. Yeah, okay. It's like almost like... McDonough? McDonough. Yeah. You might okay. say it a little bit wrong. All right. You know I mean? So the director... <laughs> yeah, that guy. <laughs> ...was riding a Greyhound bus across the country, and... He saw these three billboards on the side of the road in Texas that read Vider police botched up the case. And then the next billboard said waiting for a confession. And then the next billboard said, um, this could happen to you. And so the director, when he saw these, you know, looked at the case and researched all of it and thought it was really interesting. So the movie is loosely based off of this yeah, yeah but then the initial idea he just took it and ran with it and now it's fiction yeah mm -hmm. so i think he should do more movies set in america i think he does a good job with it that was my other fun fact that i forgot to say was um this is his i think his first movie that he did without colin farrell is it yeah because yeah. he did in bruges seven second mm -hmm. pass and banshees and this is his only other one yeah yeah mm -hmm. and it turned out really well I yeah. I, really I mean, like obviously, this. I it, love Colin Farrell, and I would love to watch him in more things, even though he is in a decent amount. But like, I think the director did a really good job. Mm -hmm. So that ends our famous segment. Sometimes crime is not prime and not so sublime. Yeah. Okay. Here's nice. here's the question. Sarah's got some horror movies to talk about. Parental Guide. 
Oh, uh, yeah. So this movie it's rated R. is lots of language. The subject matter is very heavy. And there is violence. There's some violence. Like, it's not. It's not horrible. Just physical violence. Though. Well, she. She. One of the things that she does is the dentist is a friend of the chief, and when Mildred goes to visit the dentist, she he starts like, he says we're gonna have to pull your tooth out, and, and he doesn't give her doesn't Novocaine give her any first. Novocaine, and he like makes a comment about how everybody's friends with the chief, and so she grabs his little drill and drills a hole in his thumb. Why did he through his thumb? Novocaine? Novocaine? That's pretty cringy to see. I didn't watch that. Um, and then, um, why did he not give her no game? Well, because he wants to, he, he like, wanted to, he wants to hurt her. her. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was okay. like an intimidation. Like, like that's my like, friend, and you should. Wow. Do that. Well, good. For, yeah. It's a really yeah. funny scene too, because yeah. like she's she's back at work, and then the cops show up, and. Like, she requests the Novocaine because he wasn't going to give it to her, and so he gives it to her uh-huh. after she asks for it. But then the cops show up, and they're like, did you drill a hole in the dentist's thumb? <laughs> and her mouth is, like, completely numb, and she's like, oh, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's the comedy. Yeah. The dark like, and the comedy. Yeah. What was that? Of oh, course oh, oh, not. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. That was deserved. If you're going to pull somebody's teeth. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, deserved. stuff like that happens... And I think at some point they show pictures or something, don't yeah. they? Yeah, they do. Of her daughter. So well, she was burned. Yeah. After, oh, jeez. Yeah. Oh, jeez. So this is heavy. It's a heavy topic, I would yeah. say. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. All right. Anyways, what were you gonna say? Um. Okay. So Sarah's got. When when should we do Sarah's famous segment? Sarah's mm-hmm. corner of horrors. <laughs> Right now. All right. Oh, do you feel gosh. prepared? No, I don't. Okay. I really don't. Do you, but do you... you know, it's it is what it is. That's okay. okay. And I'm pro- I'll, maybe I'll get on a roll. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I won't. I don't know. It's it's very loosey goosey. It's only one way to find out. It's really hard um, because there's so much that I could talk about. Just start. That it's like okay. We want to hear it. So when you guys asked me what I wanted to talk about, I I think I just started like rattling stuff off, and then. In doing that, I was just like thinking about like how in the last in this year in 2023, there's been a lot of like sequels of like classic horror franchises, like Saw Mm -hmm. and The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. And my phone is not really loading anything right now. Evil Dead. Evil Dead. Mm -hmm. What else did we say? Those are the ones that I came up with, but there could be others. Was there a paranormal? Was there an Insidious this year? Was, Actually, wasn't there? I think there might have I been. I think there might have been. Was there a paranormal activity or a conjuring? Let's see. Uh-huh. Okay, well, I hope this doesn't make... Oh, The Nun? They did a Nun sequel? Isn't that the one that we saw? You no. guys watched The Nun? No, 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 no. The trailer. The trailer, that's what I'm saying. Oh. Yeah. That time that we... The Nun sucks. Okay. Oh, really? <laughs> Sorry. They did a pet cemetery? I didn't even know that. Oh, really? They did Haunted Mansion. Oh, yeah, that's another one. That um, one's been dead forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know what it was. Know, they did another movie, scream yeah. I'm seeing here. Or adjacent. Yeah. Is that the one that they had a they ton did of commercials about? Yeah. yeah, so they did. They did a lot of sequels this year. And I mean, going into the season, I was like super excited. Because I just kept seeing like one after the other after the other. And I was like, wow, wow, it's awesome. Yeah, so then we were talking about that. And then I was like, okay, The Exorcist. Like The Exorcist is one that I could talk about because I've read the book too. And then I also read the sequel to the book. I didn't know it was a book first. It was a book Mm -hmm. first. By William Peter Blatty. And he is a fantastic writer in my opinion. And he deals with like... I would say that The Exorcist plays out like almost like a drama with like horror elements to it. And like drama is probably my second favorite, like a good Mm -hmm. drama show or movie is probably like my second favorite genre. Mm -hmm. And if you can hit both the horror and the drama nails on the head, that's a good ass. I'm sorry. (laughs) That's That's a a good movie. That's a happy Sarah. Swearing is a lot. Yeah, you're allowed to swear. Just don't say the F word. Oh, okay. That's a good ass movie right there. Um... And so I watched The Exorcist for the first time, the original Exorcist of, which came out in 1973. I was going to guess. 80? Um, no, yeah. 73. It's an old movie. 
Um, I watched it like in 2016 and I was like literally right out of high school and I hadn't even watched a horror movie like on purpose until I turned 18. Like, cause I was scared. Yeah. Like, you know, like you're, you're over at somebody's house and you're watching or like whatever, you're just kind of in a situation. Um, I was always curious about them. Like my whole life, like when Coraline came out and I was like, I don't know, 12, like I was, I wanted to see, I was dying to see that movie. Like I always had a curiosity about it. But, like, they used to keep me up at night, and they used to scare me. me, and, like, yeah, and I would see the commercials, and, like, just from seeing a commercial, I would be up at night and like, bad dreams for a week or two. Like, when I saw Coraline, I'm getting off topic here, but when I saw Coraline, you guys have both seen that movie. Yeah, yeah, we love that movie. Um, I, for, like, two weeks, I had to shower with the door open. I don't know if you remember this, Brayden. Um, he's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> so we grew up together. <laughs> Uh, for like a week or two after I saw that movie, I had a shower with the door open because I was like, I had this horrible image in my head of the other other mother like opening the shower curtain and like oh, poking her head in there. Holy moly! And so like I had to shower with the thing open because I'm like, if that happens, I need to be able to scream and people need to be able to come help me without any delays. <laughs> so like I've yeah I've so been there. So that's why you screamed that one day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the other shower. mother was there. Okay, she was. And then nobody believed me and I, okay. And it was really traumatizing, (laughs) but anyway, (laughs) so like, yeah, I, I was really new to horror and I feel like I wasn't in a place to appreciate this movie when I first watched it and I watched it and I had been watching like American horror story and like modern horror movies. And I just like laughed a lot and I thought it was really like, cause it's an old movie. And so a lot of the special effects are just outdated. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I would just, I thought it was really dumb. And I was like, why is this such, like, a, why is this considered a classic? Why is it so good? And then I recently rewatched it a few months ago. And I, like, lost my mind. And then I watched it, like, two more times. And then I watched... This, lost your mind because it was so good. Because it was so good. <laughs> and then I watched the sequel, which is called Legion. Um, and that's referencing, like, legions yeah. of demons. Um, and I lost my mind again, even more that time. Cause that movie is a little bit newer. Um, and it's so scary to me, I think, even though it's old and then I made, uh, I made my boyfriend watch it. Sorry if you have to edit that out. It's okay. We'll bleep them out. When did Legion come out? 1990. That's when Legion came out. Nope. Wait. What? That's a pretty long time. No, that's not right. Though. Was it? Well, anyway, it's a little newer. It's like 17 years later, right? For a sequel. Yeah. And it was really good. But the oh, fun fact, I have a fun fact, I have a fun fact about <laughs> Legion. Um, William Peter Blatty, the writer, the author of the books, actually directed this one. Oh. And so it's really, really cool. And I could, I can just, I can work out about it forever. That's crazy. Usually when an author directs, a movie or screenwrites it it can turn into like a complete disaster mm-hmm. like jk rowling for example mm-hmm. what did she oh the play no she screen wrote all the fantastic beast movies oh and people don't like those generally yeah <laughs> poopy noise yeah the first one was all right but i mean but that's cool. yeah i agree and, I agree he, and he directed it Assessment. and he did a good job that's okay he did such a good job wait okay wait that's back really to the exorcist genuinely what's scary. even the plot of the exorcist oh okay yeah let's follow the format should i read it because i feel like i'll botch you it can if you want to. it might be easier for me to just read it um but i feel like there's not a person alive who doesn't know the plot of the exorcist Except for Micah, yeah. Guess. Except for me, <laughs> you, it's basically sure what it sounds it. like. Like a girl yeah, gets possessed, and then there's an exorcism. Okay, The Exorcist is a 1973 American supernatural horror film directed by William Friedrich, from a screenplay by William Peter Blatty, based on his 1971 novel of the same name. Um, the film stars Ellen Burstyn, Max von Sydow, and Jason Miller and Linda Blair. The, the story follows the demonic possession of a young girl and her mother's attempts to rescue her through an exorcism by two Catholic priests. Um, One thing that I really love about this movie and the book, obviously, is the main character, Chris McNeil, that's the character's name, is a famous actress. And she's, I don't know if she is expressly an atheist or an agnostic, but she's not really like a believer in the movie person. Of, of like God or anything. Mm-hmm. Like okay. she's kind of like, I just think like for an old movie, 
she does she and William Peter Blatter Blatty Blatter <laughs> in writing her character and the way that she acts it and the way it's written in the movie do such a good job of portraying like a woman like a modern woman with her head up between her two shoulders and like and she's not like obnoxious about it but she's not like a believer but she's you know she's smart and she's logical and she tries everything before she before she tries you know before she kind of accepts like okay this might be like supernatural mm -hmm. so you think she was ahead of her time this yes. character the character okay. and the author was ahead of his time for writing her and problem solving of her own not yeah. just oh no yeah okay. she's not a she's not a damsel in distress okay even the movie makes her a little bit more of a damsel in distress than the book writes her to be um she's she comes off a little more desperate and that's just because like they have to cut out a lot of things in my opinion mm -hmm. from the book of her trying to do different things in different avenues and yeah. having arguments with different people and they had to cut all of that out obviously because you don't want it to be a wait because who's movie. possessed in relation her, her daughter her daughter her okay. daughter reagan okay reagan mcneil and and then like the relationship between chris and reagan too mother daughter relationship is so well done and it's like so endearing and like it's acted so well um and so you're really like i don't know for me like you're just really really rooting for them so i have a question mm -hmm. um did you watch captain marvel no okay so there's this part in captain marvel where captain marvel has her college friend or whatever right and she's a pilot mm -hmm. and they're talking about how they're going to go to space mm -hmm. and the friend is like i can't do that i have a daughter and the daughter's overhearing and she's like it's basically like one of those like woke feminist moments mm -hmm. of like the daughter being like i would be so disappointed in you if you didn't go to space even though, like, <laughs> child abandonment and all that whatever mm -hmm. do you feel like it's like that the daughter is like seven by the way yeah and it, being raised by the single parent yeah it's like how are you going to get your food daughter daughter doesn't even understand what the implications of that are. yeah yeah your mom might never come back you yeah. know, I didn't feel like it was like that. I didn't feel like it was trying to really push an agenda, okay. in my opinion. It didn't feel like it was over the top or obnoxious, like I said. Like, it just seemed like, I I don't know. It's just, like, rare where I watch a movie from the 1970s where a female character yeah. and the way she's written doesn't piss me off. Right. Yeah. You and should, it didn't. You should yeah. watch Alien. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is an inside Have joke. Have we talked about this? Yeah, you told me that Alien, like, freaks you out. Alien freaks yeah. me out. Yeah. I'm not just some weird, like, horror mutant that isn't scared. <laughs> like, I have desens... You've heard people say this, I'm sure. Like, I've desensitized myself to it, yeah. to horror. For, you know... But not entirely. Like... Yeah, you said this was scary. Alien yeah, was it scares scared you. me. Yeah. Or the exorcist. And the Alien, I don't, I don't like, like... There is a category in horror called body horror, mm -hmm. and that messes with me more than like most other types. Yeah, I don't like body horror. So you wouldn't. For you, the most part. So then you haven't seen like the fly or the thing or anything like that either. No, okay. I've seen like Human Centipede though, and that's arguably Each, yeah. probably worse. Than I've heard those pretty bad. Yeah, body horror, gross. Like it's just not the type of horror that I um, enjoy. Not the aesthetics that I that I'm here for. I like yeah. this. I like spooky. Okay, scary. Skeletons. I like the spooky aesthetic, and I can do gore. Like I love the Saw films, not all of them, but like I love the Saw um, franchise, and so I can do that. But like, so what would you say is your top three horror recommendations for people? Um, wait, but first I have That's to right. just talk about the religious thing a little bit more in the Exorcist in spiritual, yeah, because the author of the book is. A Christian I think and mm. um and you feel like he wait is she atheist or agnostic he oh Chris McNeil yeah I don't know if it ever says I would guess if I had to take a guess I think she's agnostic no okay. I can't remember if it ever yeah. says yeah. so you feel like the author who is a Christian mm -hmm. wrote an agnostic really well I think so I think it was fair I think that's pretty impressive. And when I listened to or when I read Legion the sequel i thought that he was jewish because the main character of that book is jewish okay and i was like okay so he's probably jewish because this 
character has some really deeply personal struggles with religion that I think he kind of like describes really, really well Mm -hmm. with religion and spirituality and faith in God and like the struggles that a person kind of goes through. Um, Certain people, I guess, rather. And he just did it so well. And like it, and I can go into this more. So I thought, assumed he was Jewish and then I looked him up and found out, oh, he's actually Christian. That's interesting. That's interesting. I don't know. I, I considered myself an agnostic for like, I don't know, the better part of like seven years probably or eight. Mm-hmm. And it was the book Legion by William Peter Blatty that kind of like made me start to think in a way that nothing ever has before about like the possible existence of like a higher entity. Mm-hmm. Like, Oh, interesting. Yeah. It is interesting that you would find that in something categorized as horror. Yeah. Which is why I'm like, one of the reasons why I'm like, you have to, you have to address this category because there's so much good stuff. That's, that's cool that you said that. Cause, um, we did, we just talked about a Christmas Carol Mm -hmm. and Scrooge has a spiritual experience talking with a bunch of ghosts and Mm -hmm. being haunted all night, basically. Mm Mm-hmm. And I thought that that was a really awesome way to describe because when he wakes up, there's no proof that anything actually happened, but he still changed. Yeah. And he, he got he, his, his life changing spiritual experience came from ghosts. Yeah. You know, it can it's, come from anywhere really. It's that like he gives a voice to some like concerns and questions that I've had that I've never heard anybody give a voice to. And it could only have been done in the format of a book, in my opinion. Hmm. And the movie, like the movie was deeply um, interesting and entertaining for me. It falls apart at the end. And I don't Legion does or Legion does. And the the reviews I don't think are that they're not tremendous. Like they're not great. They're not sublime. Not sublime. They're not terrible. They're good for a horror movie. Okay. Um, Decent. I think they're like 60 or something. But honestly, I feel like it a little bit makes sense. I feel like in some aspects, religion can be seen as ex- extreme and like mm. horror is extreme in my own opinion, because I hate horror movies. No, you no, 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 no. Like, I feel like it kind of would make sense in some weird way that it would make you think about extremes, yeah. you know, and that mm. really like religion could be brought up in this because it's an extreme. Or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Legion isn't the book isn't scary. Oh, it's not. Not really. Okay. In my opinion, it's not. I don't even know if it, it's considered horror because the ending is so different, and um, it's just really it is really different from the movie. They made a lot of different choices. Um, I would say the movie's a lot scarier than the book. So I just think he's just a genuinely good author who happens to be good at horror, good author and like a thinker. That's kind of like the vibe that I get. So anyway, but like top three horror nights really hard, but. Well, sorry, let me back up. Are you finished talking about The Exorcist and Legion? I can be. I can keep. <laughs> I uh, let's do a parent's guide on those. Okay. First. Okay. Um, horror is my favorite genre. So like, I don't even like really necessarily process like language that much it doesn't really hit me as like oh oh that was ooh. yeah but i think there's probably a lot of swearing in it because are they rated r yes mm-hmm. okay. and they don't they don't spare any frightening details for the time like i mean it was 1973 and so the special effects are kind of like janky mm-hmm. do like older horror movies scare you have you ever tried to watch one does Jaws scare you? I'm going to try and force her to watch Night of the Hunter next year. I did watch Jaws when I was in middle school. Mm-hmm. And I was scared. Like, I was at they my were friend's. In middle school, though. I know, that's true. But I was at my friend's house up the street and I had to ride my bike home. And I was like, <laughs> I'm so scared! Which, sure like, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> exactly. Like, how does that make any sense? <laughs> well, I, I don't think that, like, the thing about horror is, like, fear is not a logical emotion. Yeah. And I tried to explain this to J- her sister. Um, cause she's like, if I just think like, if I don't put myself in a situation, then I'm not scared anymore. I'm like, I don't think it works like that. Like yeah, it kind no. of overrides. Like you have these images in your head and it brings back those emotions. Cause it's like very yeah. deeply. Um, it's an emotional thing. It, it's like from your amygdala, like that doesn't have anything to do with your prefrontal cortex or logic. So you're, 
you're gonna yeah anyway you're just gonna be like a visceral reaction to images that you have in your brain so the themes are dark very dark is there gore and like violence i mean it's Uh, i'm trying to think i'm assuming i mean she's possessed it's just don't show this to your kids there's a scene where there's like a, a statue of like the virgin mary this is like in the first 20 minutes of the movie and it's been like defaced um and i'm not going to go into detail but it's graphic and like vulgar hmm. and it and there's like red paint or maybe it's blood and it's okay. like yeah in a church and it's just kind of out of nowhere like you're not expecting it and then this priest just turns around and he sees it it's like one of those types of movies like you're not safe in this movie for kids it's not it's not safe for work <laughs> don't show it for you don't show it to your kids okay all right, and then your top three. Yeah, that's movies. really, really hard. And it'll, it would probably change if you asked me like a few months from now, but I'm going to have to say that like the Exorcist series is up there. I didn't even talk about the new one when I thought about it. I have another one, but I want to save it for the end. A uh, recommendation? Yeah, for my top three. I don't, I don't know. I can think of two that I definitely want to say. And then all I can think of is Saw because I watched the Saw series this year for the first time. And so, like, that's, like, in my brain. But I don't know if that is really fair to say that that's one of my favorites. It's one of my favorites. I don't know if it's the top three. But I guess for now, as a placeholder, we'll say Saw. I just, like... For number two. They're very entertaining. Uh, No, it'll be, like, number... If we're ranking them, like, Mm -hmm. one, two, three? That'll be three. Well, no, 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 that's fine. Uh, Okay, okay. That's number two. So, Saw, in my opinion, the second movie is, is the best one. I like that one a lot. Um, and then for the third one, it's not a movie, it's not a show, but it's a director and everything that he's done in the last like 10 years. And that's Mike Flanagan. All right. Yeah. Flanagan. Flanagan. People have now coined the term Flaniverse for mm-hmm. his um, Netflix series that he started doing like four years ago or five years ago. And the first one um, that people will have heard of is The Haunting of Hill House. And then there's The Haunting of Blind Manor, Midnight Mass, Midnight Club. And then this year he came out with Fall of the House of Usher. And that's a, it's a masterpiece and it's fantastic. And it's, yeah, it's all based on like Edgar Allan Poe. Um, I don't know if they're all short stories or books or if there's any books or if they're all short stories and poems, I don't know. I just don't want to get it wrong, but it's it's like a tribute to Edgar Allan Poe, but it's also his own thing, and it's, it's not an adaptation of them. No, it's no, not. it's oh, okay. modern, mm-hmm. and each episode title is one of his works, um, with a few exceptions, which are like lines from his works, but you know they're mm-hmm. still references, um, but they're like you know his own original characters, his own original plot, everything. And it's really, really good. The Flaniverse. The Flaniverse. We don't have to talk about that for too long. But if you're a listener and you like horror, Mike Flanagan, look him up. His movies are great. His series are great on Netflix. Um, and I'm obsessed. Okay. And he works. He works with the same kind of troupe of actors. Not not always the same, but like he brings actors with him. I like yeah. it when. Yeah, directors, like directors do that. Do that yeah. yeah, what comes to mind is like Tim Burton. Always yeah. using Johnny Depp and Helena, Helena, Helena Bonnard, Bonnard blah, 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 blah. <laughs> or, yeah. And like other Harry Potter actors. Or McDonough always using Colin Farrell. Colin Farrell, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he, he does using... that. And so then if you become fan a fan of like actors in the show too, then that's just an added bonus. You're yeah. like, I love this actor. Like, And Follow the House of Usher is great because it includes like almost all of the ones that are my favorites throughout his works. Almost all, not all, almost all, not all. (laughs) It's fun to be an asshole in the theater when you see a trailer and you're like, I know that actor. You probably don't, (laughs) but I know him because I saw like uh, Killian Murphy because he's, he's never really had like a starring role in a movie. Oh, I find that frustrating. Until recently. But like, but like when he, I remember it was like A Quiet Place 2 was coming out and he was featured in the trailer and Mike and I both looked at each other because we watched Peaky Blinders and we're like, there he is. (laughs) There's the man right there. 
cool, but you misinterpreted my that's frustrating. I find it frustrating when you know an actor and you love them and nobody else does. I'm yeah. not like, oh, this is like, oh, I know them. I'm like, oh, I wish you knew, but you'll never understand and I'll never convince you to watch all like 10 hours of this content yeah. that you'll need to watch <laughs> to understand. And, and then we, we just watch. like to spit on poor people that don't. I just that yeah. don't know. Yeah, that, that we idiots. like to spit on poor people. I think you should cut it right there. <laughs> I'm going to put that in quotes. That's going to be a quote. And I, like to, post it on on I like to spit on the poor people. Yeah. <laughs> We just like to spit on. That's what Micah said. <laughs> okay. I read a book. Um, the Republic of Pirates, written in 20, 2000, 2007, 2007, written by Colin Woodard. And this is a nonfiction book about the golden age of piracy, which took mm -hmm. place. Let me just read my summary. How about? Does it have Blackbeard in it? Yes. Oh, oh whoa, whoa, whoa. don't jump ahead. I'm going to talk about him. Sorry. Okay. Um, this book covers the history and individual stories of the key figures in the golden age of piracy between 1650 and 1720. We explore the rise and fall of such legendary figures as Black Sam Bellamy, Henry Morgan, Captain Morgan. Oh, the rum guy. Mm -hmm. uh, Francis Drake, Benjamin Hornigold. Sir Francis Sir Drake. Francis Drake. Um, Benjamin Hornigold, Blackbeard, and many more. I jumped ahead by a whole 30 seconds. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it also you. chronicles the efforts of the main, meant to say man, credited <laughs> with ending the golden age of piracy, Woods Rogers. Is that like an authority figure? Yes. Okay. He was sent by the crown to mm. round them up, basically, and end it. Just to end it. Just take one dip and end it. Does anyone else think it's weird that there was a period of time where everyone was taking orders from an inanimate object the crown the crown the crown um, uh, i guess it hasn't really affected my life so i haven't really thought about <laughs> yeah it. we when, we, to, when like, we when we went to like england it, it was kind of weird like seeing all this like royalty stuff everywhere oh i was making a joke like <laughs> yeah because people yeah, say the yeah. crown and they mean royalty but like they mean the queen i was imagining queen. they were literally just taking orders from a crown yeah, they, well, I mean, they may have been. it kind of is. It's just a concept. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> um, what did I like about it? Uh, this period of history is really interesting. Mm -hmm. I never, I didn't know much about it, and now I know a lot more about it. Can you tell us what they mean by golden age of piracy? Just when it was uh, very common and mm -hmm. easy to be a pirate. and It's like the romanticized version that we usually see mm -hmm. of the Caribbean and such. Like, that was when it was... Yeah. That time period is kind of like, yeah, yeah, because like, okay, so here, let me set the stage for why. Okay. So the colonies had just been discovered or recently ish been discovered. Anyway, there's not a lot of law and order in the colonies and, and you have Spain and Portugal and England and France fighting over these different territories. So nobody's really in charge it's really difficult to stop people from just stealing. So it just, it just led to this perfect cauldron of simmering thievery. Debauchery. And debauchery in, in the Caribbean slash Bahamas area. Oh, it actually was? Mm-hmm. Oh. Yep. So like Nassau, the Bahamas, North mm. and South Carolina, all up and down the Atlantic seaboard piracy. Mm. Um, Cuba. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so the very interesting period of history, and it reads like it's a collection of stories, so you'll follow Black Sam Bellamy for a while, and then you'll follow Blackbeard for a while, and you'll follow, you know, whatever. Do you ever jump back and follow them again? Yeah, sometimes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, and it's very rich in detail, yeah. And, uh, yeah, what did I not like about it, you ask? Good question. Um, I did I, ask. Really, really, the only thing was I would like to read some more pirate books, more books about the history of pirates to see, like, what maybe is true and what is not true. Or, like, you know, who, do, do people agree with this author's take? You said this was historical fiction? Not fiction at all. It's, oh. it's like, historical. Oh, okay. Yeah, nonfiction book. Um, Can but, you take basically everything that happens as fact? Or are there some interpretations? Yeah, that's why I would want to read more. Okay. Because I, I would like to know if everybody agrees with mm. this author. Because, like, the 
the general message I took away from this was the pirates weren't as bad as everybody thinks they were hmm. in a lot of cases. In some cases they were. In a lot of the famous cases, they weren't. Hmm. Yeah. So I would like to read more, but that's not really a knock against well, the book. Well, explain what you mean by that. I will. Okay. Yeah. In my next segment, Gar Yar, me mateys. <laughs> Okay, so this is just like little fun things that I wanted to share with everybody about this book. I haven't been able to sh stop telling people about all these pirates. I know. I know. <laughs> okay, let me skim this real quick. Um, so just something to say, just like a little thing to teach people, I guess, if maybe they don't know. So there's a distinction between a privateer and a pirate. And a privateer is someone that is given permission by their country to go and raid other ships. So like the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth would tell people, yeah, go raid some Spanish some uh, Spanish ships, bring back the gold and you won't be prosecuted. Those were privateers because mm -hmm. they were technically allowed to be doing that. And they were given what's called um, a letter of mark or letters of mark, which is what they offer Jack Sparrow in oh. in the second parts of the Caribbean, I think. Oh. Um, so a lot of pirates were actually privateers, but it was basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. So Henry Morgan and Sir Francis Drake are examples of privateers. And what's a buccaneer? So they talk about that. It it comes from like some French word. I don't remember exactly. It like has to do with the way that they cooked meat. But it, it just became another word for like a pirate, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, this is a fun little fun fact. I talked about Pope Alexander the Sixth when I talked about the Florence book, and he's like the freaking worst pope of all time, just a dick. And uh, apparently, he gave Spain all of the land to the West at some point, like in the in the New World, not knowing how big it was. In the like the Americas. Yeah. Good going. Yeah. Pope. And um, this. How, uh, wait, and, and this how led, was that his to give? I don't know. I need to go back and read this. Maybe okay. I, but anyway, like this, this led to so much like turmoil and mm -hmm. made it impossible for the Spanish to control that whole, mm. all that land, um, which like led to per the perfect cond conditions for pirates to exist. Mm -hmm. Working for the English mercantile or the Navy was horrible back in the day. Like, it was not uncommon for half of the crew, 40% to half of the crew, to be dead by the end of the voyage. Wow. Because... How the, long was the voyage? Could be, yeah, like, a year or so. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, scurvy, um, bilge was really nasty and filthy mm -hmm. and just gross. There were accidents all the time mm -hmm. that happened on the ships, like people getting their legs crushed. Yikes. Um, divers, they would send divers down, and you could easily die as a diver. If you got the bends, then you were pretty much dead. Wait, what did they use as oxygen? Because Jacques think they Cousteau did. invented the iron lung, which was essentially the first scuba tank. Yeah. Is this when they literally just had like these like it bubbles just, on their head and they were like breathing like the air inside of them? It could have just oh, been man. free diving because you I think that's get really good You get some bends from free diving? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Well, but, yeah. I, I have something about the bends here. I thought it had, you know, it had to be, like, breathing in, like... No, so it no. has to do with the CO2 level just inside of your blood. Yeah. And the further you go down, the quicker it can happen. Like, mm. so the quicker is, you can get more CO2 inside your blood. This is it. So divers surface too quickly after being down too long, and the nitrogen that began to That's accumulate in their blood due to the pressure... Oh, the pressure. Okay. ...starts to bubble in the blood when they come up so that's why yes. like scuba divers and all that they have to surface slowly yeah. and hold at a certain spot to let yeah that release from their blood chemistry baby yeah physiology love it okay i'm gonna skip some so of this other would stuff. you say that 40 percent to half of these um crewmates died because they just overall didn't get good no they weren't good no. they should have got good get the okay. it's their fault <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, the whole point of that also, the, um, they were paid almost nothing and there were these things called press gangs and they would just wander the streets of like London or Bristol 
And if they found any sailors that weren't working, they would force them onto a ship. How could they? What? So was this like a draft? Like they were forced it wasn't by the even, government? Basically? Yeah, basically like that, except they didn't get paid. Because would choose. Yeah, it was like they yeah. choose to go on one of these voyages. Was there like a lot no. of glory in it? Or like... no? People were like terrified of press gangs. They would hide uh -huh. and pretend to be different professions. Oh, that's different so professionals. So like mm -hmm. the English mercantile and navy treated their sailors like dirt. They would promise wages, and then they would withhold them. They would return to port after their voyage. Then they'd withhold their wages that they were owed from the previous voyage until the next voyage started. What the hell? So if you didn't come back, you forfeited your money, your pay. Yeah, that's super illegal. So it was horrible to be a sailor. So when you hear all this, it kind of makes sense why so many people hated the naval and merchant merchant vessels and wanted to be pirates because that was basically the only way to make a living they were basically robbed in the first place yes yeah mm. so you start to see like you know what maybe i'm kind of on the pirate side about this <laughs> um i'm gonna skip a couple of things and then go straight to some of the more famous pirates and talk a little bit about them um the first one black sam bellamy most successful pirate of all time and by that i mean he was the richest by a lot and uh, he was called Black Sam because instead of wearing a wig, he tied his long black hair back with some string. <laughs> like that? Did a lot of the pirates wear wigs? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. But he was like one of the earlier ones at the Golden Age. Tied so. his hair back with some string. But um, he, he was a big booty baller. Nice. So. What kind of string? Uh, was it just, twine? Just some twine. Oh, okay. Lars got the twine for <laughs> Lars him. got the twine. Too late. Lars got the twine. And, uh, okay, so he was working with a guy called Williams. I don't remember who Williams was at this point. What they did was they went out and found disenfranchised men and began seizing vessels and pirating together. And there was a huge hurricane that wrecked a Spanish galleon. At Which one, is a type of ship. A massive ship. This is the okay. biggest kind of ship. Mm. And, like, pirates... those that can't see which is everybody Braden just stretched his arms out as, as wide as they go as wide as they go and so that far. still isn't even as big as a galleon wow believe it seriously or not. yeah my word Bigger I thought this. galleons were units of currency yeah me too I thought it was a coin that's from, from Harry, Harry Potter. Potter yeah oh. <laughs> yeah nice nice uh connection yes that's from Harry Potter um so typically pirate ships were pretty small they were mm. nimble and fast, and normally they only had like one mast. They're called sloops. So like the one Jack Sparrow rides in on that sinks. Yeah, kinda. Yeah. More exactly more like, like the um Exactly like that on the high seas. What's what's the really fast one from Black Pirates Black of the Pearl? Caribbean? No, the the one that they steal from the Navy. The Flying Dutchman. No. <laughs> no, it doesn't oh, matter. That's Davy Jones. It's, it's the, okay. It's the one that they think can outrun the Black Pearl, but I have it can't. No idea. Okay, anyway. So they basically pirates never had a shot at taking a galleon, but then a hurricane wrecked it mm. and just scattered tons of um, treasure all over the place. Oh. And that's how Black Sam Bellamy made his huge fortune. Oh, he got lucky. Yeah, he got lucky, and he mm. went and pillaged that. That's why he's not famous. That ship. Um, okay, next guy. And maybe he just doesn't have the best name. I mean, Blackbeard. It's Black, very long. Black Sam Bellamy is pretty Black cool. Black Sam yeah, Bella Blackbeard. That just that's five flows. Syllables. Black Sam. Don't you think that's cool? I want to correct. He is famous, obviously, because there's he's in books, but he's not as famous as Blackbeard. Yes. Yes. Here he is, the badass bidding of Blackbeard. Okay, Blackbeard was a badass. He wore three brace of pistols on his coat to intimidate people. So he just had you know pistols all over his front. And he was a really tall, big dude with crazy wild hair and a crazy beard. And his eyes are described as being really fierce and terrifying. Mm -hmm. And if that wasn't enough, he used to lit fuses. He used to light fuses under his hat so his face would be surrounded by smoke and fire. <laughs> and people would see him and they'd be like, "Let's surrender. Wow. <laughs> let's it not. Let's not fight this seems guy." Seems kind of dangerous to light fire on your head with wild hair, but yeah. you know what? He's badass. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't matter. But that was exactly what he wanted. He wanted people to be afraid of him so he wouldn't have to fight. Mm. So he was really, he was quite smart in the way that he did that. Um, so there was a, there was a guy who was a total fanboy of pirates named Steed, or William Bonnet, his name was. And he was a privileged dude from, can't remember where. 
and he just decided to become a pirate and he sucked at it. He was terrible. And um, Blackbeard basically took him under his wing and taught him how to be a pirate. But then he betrayed him later. Which one betrayed which? Uh, Blackbeard betrayed Steed Bonnet later. Oh. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting. Are we sure that that's what happened? That just doesn't sound like Blackbeard to me. Not the Blackbeard I know. So, I know. so Blackbeard at a certain point and, decided and... he wanted to retire. And so his ship was called the Queen Anne's Revenge. That was his flagship. Oh. And he decided, you know what? I'm ready to retire. I'm going to go take a pardon. I'm going to go live in North Carolina and just chill. And he ran his ship aground on purpose so that he could get out of paying the crew as much as he possibly could. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That doesn't sound like the Blackbeard that we've all that we come know. to know and love. No. But what's what's really interesting is um, he there's no historical evidence that he ever murdered a single person. Like what about um, no? Kansas? So yeah, so that's that's a really common um, rumor Who? about him. The R word. Uh, uh, he, okay, you yeah. guys said that in your other podcast, yeah. and I didn't know. Okay, because there's another R word. Oh yeah, so that's I feel like true. somehow you need to clarify which one you're talking the about. The R word assault version. Anyway. Did he never? Ass- uh, there's no evidence of him assaulting women. So the only the only time that this book talks about that is he gets married to someone in North Carolina, and there's a rumor that he allowed his crew to R word her. That's as plenty a, messed as a, up. As a gang. Oh. But geez. the author says based on all the evidence of how his encounters were with prisoners, how his encounters were with other ships, how he treated his crew, how he treated people. It's really unlikely. But all of that isn't women, probably. Prisoners, his yeah. crew, probably but, not. But women. this but this book this book says like it's very unlikely that mm. he did that. Yeah. We just don't know. We don't we'd have to yeah. ask his good. There's not there's not enough information, but like based on all the reports, all the evidence, you know, he was a feared guy. Mm-hmm. And that's the way he wanted it. He wanted people to surrender, but he never actually was um, really a monster, as far as we can tell mm. from the historical evidence. That's interesting. So that's Blackbeard. Kind um, of this is funny. This is really funny. Okay. This is called The Woes of William Pierce and the Big Fat Bully, Charles Vane. Charles Vane is a pirate. William Pierce was sent by the Crown to Nassau to enforce the surrender slash pardon of the pirates. At a certain point, the king issues a pardon to all pirates. And a lot of them want to take it. Charles Vane doesn't want to take it. Um, Okay, Vane and 20 others took took the pardon officially, but they kept on pirating. Vane ended up stealing a sloop and then went in through the back door to Nassau Harbor. There was another way into Nassau Harbor, but it was a lot. It's a sloop. Small ship. Um, so he was able to go through the back way because it was a small ship. William Pierce couldn't follow him because he had a big ship. Hmm. So Charles Vane, William Pierce is here in Nassau Harbor. Charles Vane takes the back way into Nassau Harbor on a stolen ship right in front of William Pierce, but Pierce cannot do anything about it. And so that night they're just, they're having a huge party and they're drinking and hollering and looting the ship and Pierce can't do anything about it. So Pierce decides to try and get some men onto rowboats and row to Mm -hmm. um, Vane's sloop. Mm -hmm. But Vane was ready for him, and so they get into a gunfight. William Pierce has to retreat. Um, Another thing that happened later was Pierce had had an interest in a trading vessel that was sent out to sea. So he had money wrapped up in this trading vessel. And Charles Vane was like, oh... So you want to make some money with this trading vessel. I'm going to go raid it. (laughs) So he raids the trading vessel, captures it, and sails it back to Nassau Harbor and flies a black flag on the mast. So he steals William Pierce's ship, basically, brings it back right in front of his face, puts the pirate flag on it. (laughs) Okay. Um, And then a bunch of the men that were working on the trading ship decided to defect to Charles Vane's crew. So he loses a bunch of his crew (laughs) as well. Um, And then at a certain point, someone on Pierce's ship accidentally set fire to it. (laughs) And the ship was ironically called the Phoenix. (laughs) (laughs) Are you sure? The Phoenix. 
yeah, he was just, he, it, they put it out really quickly, but at oh. that point, like, everyone was so demoralized, because so they funny. couldn't do anything to Vane, that they just decided, they just decided they were going to leave. On the way out, his ship runs aground. <laughs> So this is the equivalent of basically this this poor kid just getting bullied and then he trips on the way walking Aww. like walking away just trips over himself. <laughs> so that was the story of the woes of William Pierce and the big fat bully Charles Bain. Yeah, the really interesting stuff. I'm gonna not read any of them, any uh, anything else. So what's the parents' guide on this book? Um, it's you can read it basically at any age, I think. I mean, they talk about the R word a little bit, and there are some descriptions of, like, accidents that happen on the ship that are kind of graphic. Maybe I would say, like, you know, if you're 10, you're probably okay. Yeah. Really? I, th- I think so. It, it's not, like, it's not relentlessly graphic. Do, do a lot graphic. of 10-year-olds understand what that word is? I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know either. I, th- I think it's not that bad, okay. is okay. the upshot. Okay. So I would rate this nine the bends out of ten. It's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I think that's good. Woo! You have anything you're gonna watch, Brady? Well, Shorzy's always on the list. I think this is the week. Yeah. Well, okay. We will be talking about Ted Lasso season three next week. Mm-hmm. So and possibly wanna... Shorzy. And po- yeah, short. I mean, at this point, we we just have to buckle down and do it, right? Yeah. What so, are you? what are you watching? Me, yeah. um, White Lotus. White oh, Lotus. Oh, I seen that. Yeah, Is it good. It's good. Okay, you didn't like it. <laughs> Anyways, no. <laughs> um, it just, just didn't blow me away. Yeah, that's fair. Mm. It's good. Yeah. Entertaining. I I was gripped. I watched it. I think I binged it both seasons. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. So. What are you watching, Sarah? I'm not going to be on the podcast. I know, time. but what are you yeah, watching? Yeah, but yeah. Um, I'm not an idea of what you'll be watching. Watch a lot random of Random last second plug-in, Talk to Me. I finally watched that. Uh-huh. That was another movie that came out. Well, it came out last year, actually. Um, and it was like a, an indie film, I think. Very, it was low budget, like film festival film. Really, really good. Anyway, that's it. That's all I'm gonna say about that. I finally. I've heard it's it. good. It's good. I have heard it's good. It's sad. I think it's sad. I, actually, I think I watched a review that spoiled everything. So. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's just good. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I I like to rewatch things too. So sometimes I just rewatch my old favorites. Um. So oh, maybe maybe I'll do that. I don't have a lot of time on my hands. Yeah. Life is busy. Who does? Yeah. Oh! Uh, the Descent is a really good one. I, if I had thought of that when you asked me what my top three were, The Descent is really good. Okay, sorry. That's okay. I told you, it's really, like, there's so much. Yeah. Oh, I probably will finish Journey to the Center of the Earth also. The book? The book, the book yeah. Mm, like the movie. It's like for You're, kids. You reminded me <laughs> of when you said Descent. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very different movies. Well, By the way, <laughs> very different. <laughs> nah, they're probably the same. Yeah, you're right. All right. Thanks, everybody. This was reviewable. Yay. Bye.